He is saving us. Verse 1 of chapter 15. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of all whom are still alive, though some of them have fallen asleep. Then to James, then the Apostles, last of all, Paul says to one, untimely born myself. Okay, now, the wording he uses here is that the gospel is something that he preached in which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved. It's a present reality. I didn't hear a lot of this when I was growing up in the church. I heard that you were saved and you wrote the, the date down on the, in your Bible and you prayed a prayer or whatever it may have been. And salvation was a past event in my life. I don't know if that's how you, were, you grew up or heard it, but I didn't hear a lot about that you are being saved presently. That there's a present active work of salvation going on and that's part of the good news. Because the good news is about God's power to save. And if God is saving, then the gospel is for believers right now who are being saved. And I don't know if you realize that. You're being saved right now. That's always a crazy thought, eh? Okay? Like, God's still saving you. I would say, in this room, you're all unbelievers, including myself. And you'd go, no, I'm not. I'm a Christian. No, every Christian is an unbeliever still. And what I mean by that is not unregenerate. I mean, there are areas of your life where you're still living with unbelief. Mm -hmm. And God is saving you. He's still rescuing you from putting your faith in the wrong things, the wrong people, or in your own actions. And He is saving you. And Paul was on to talk about the power of the resurrection. In this particular chapter, Paul's saying, you know, if, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, because the Corinthians were starting start to talk about there's no resurrection of the dead. He goes, wait a minute, there's no resurrection of the dead if Jesus has not been raised. If Jesus has not been raised, then we're all hopeless. We should, of all people, be the most pitied. Mm -hmm. Because we're preaching a message that has no power. That's what he basically says. And his point is, the gospel isn't just about the cross. The gospel is about the resurrection. And I, 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 one of my concerns, just I'll, I'll share with you one of my concerns, in the, in the, the cross-centered movement, which I, I'm part of it, I believe we need to preach the cross, so don't, don't get me wrong, is that we don't preach the resurrection. If we don't preach the resurrection, the cross doesn't matter. Jesus is alive. Amen. He rose from the dead. He overcame sin, death, and Satan for you and me. We are not helpless people. We have the power of the resurrected Lord. It's amazing. Look at, look at Romans 8. It, this is such good news. I feel like, man, why didn't someone teach me this when I was growing up? I hardly knew anything about the Spirit of God. It was like he was the, you know, it was like the Father, Son, and the Holy Scriptures. That was the Trinity for me. <laughs> but, but Romans 8, Paul says, verse 9, You are not in His flesh, but you're in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now listen to this. This I never heard. And I'm not trying to be critical of my church. I just, I just think... Something happened. We, we became so cross-centered that we didn't talk about the Holy Spirit and the resurrection and the power that's present today. And we live with a historical confessional faith without a power that's transform transformative for today. That's a problem. Amen. That's a real problem. And, and what did Paul say? Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. Wow. I didn't hear that preached. Mm -hmm. What I heard preached is, did you pray the prayer? Well, if you prayed the prayer and wrote it in that covered your Bible with the date, put your confidence in that. Paul would never say that. I remember when he shows up in a church, he goes, did you guys receive the Spirit? That's his first question. You want to know about assurance? Do you have the Spirit? Because if you don't have the Spirit, you don't belong to Him. Now, that's a weird statement in a lot of our churches. We don't usually ask, do you have the Spirit of God? But that is the indicator that you're God's children. Why? Because when you're cleansed by the the, the cross, the blood setting of His blood, you become a holy temple of God. When you become a holy temple, God comes and dwells in holy temples. And He dwells by His Spirit. And when the Spirit is there, He's saying, You're mine. And my Spirit in you is a deposit that I'm coming to get you when this is all done. You belong to me. But Paul doesn't say it's only about that. He also goes on to say, If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him, listen to this, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, just think about that. The Spirit of, of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is in you. If He's in you, He who raised
raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. Just stop and think about this. You have the one who raised Jesus from the dead inside of you. I mean, you just go like, whoa. Yeah. Have you ever just walked out of your house in the morning and go, Resurrection power is leaving the house. <laughs> it's yeah. The God who raised him from the dead is leaving the house in me. Yeah. That is unbelievable. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Paul says in Colossians. In you. I mean, I, I don't think we live with the truth that, that we really believe that. <laughs> When's the last time you're like, oh man, I just, I just can't make it today. Those are the best moments for you to go, resurrection God, raise me up, give me power, give me strength. Yeah. I have so many people coming in and talk to say, you know, you know how, how do you live this missional life you're talking about if you're an introvert? You need God's help. How do you say no to people if you're an extrovert? You need God's help, <laughs> right? I'm an extrovert. My wife's an introvert. She told me a while ago, you know, I've used my personality type as an excuse not to depend on the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't mean that she shouldn't get alone to be recharged at times. I'm not saying that. But she has said, there are many times when I've said, the reason why I would say I need to be alone is because I don't want to ask God for help. I wonder how many of us are going, I, I want to live like there's no resurrection power today because I'd really just love to depend on the flesh today. I mean, we don't say that out loud, but we say it all the time with our actions. I remember I used to hear people say, God will never ask you to do something that you can't do. Have you read your Bible? I mean, that is the most ridiculous statement you could ever make if you read the Bible. I mean, Moses. God makes sure he gets to a place where he has no confidence in his ability to speak when he calls him to go and speak. And what does he say? Don't worry. I am is with you until I am sent you. And by the way, I'll give you a stick to fight the Pharaoh of the land with. <laughs> what a great military strategy. <laughs> yeah, by the end of Moses' lifetime, what does he call it? The staff of God. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Moses' confidence went from him to God. God leads him to face the most powerful man on the land. And then when he leads him away, God is not very wise about his strategy in terms of his geographical escape plan, is he? Where does he lead him? To a dead end. Literally. When we read that, we're like, we, how many of you ever stop and read that and, and wonder what they must have thought when they got there? They must have been going, what is God up to? I thought he only called us to do things we could do. No, not so. Moses stick the thing in the water. Can you imagine when that thing splits and they're walking through it and there's armies chasing behind them and they're walking this way? I would be looking up going, is this thing going to hold? <laughs> and I'll tell you, if you don't ever feel like that when you're doing the work of the king, you're probably not doing the work of the king. Because if you don't ever get to a point where you're like, if he doesn't do this, we will never make it. If he doesn't come through, we have no hope. And my concern is so much of our conversation about how we can be more effective on mission is that we're putting a whole lot more trust in strategies and human strength than we are in the God who saves. It concerns me greatly. I hear so much talk about the newest thing, and it's like, hey, how about the old thing? God who leads you into a sea and spreads the waters and leads you through them by his might and his power. How about if we put our trust in that God who's still saving today? I think the church would get accomplish a whole lot if we'd stop doing what we think we could do and start walking into things that only God can do by His power and His strength. Amen. Amen. This is how we ought to really evaluate ourselves. God, when's the last time we did something we couldn't do? When's the last time we walked out into faith believing that you had to do it, not us? That's God's people. The righteous live by faith. I mean, think about Joshua. You know? I want you to put the artist in front of the military force, and we're going to have artists win this battle. I mean, I love artists, but I'm just saying. <laughs> I would not put artists on the front lines of the battle. But God will. And all they're going to do is blow horns and march. And can you imagine God's people? I, I just put yourself in that story. I mean, we, we tell it like it's a kid's story, like, oh, how cute. Come on, you know. No, it's not cute. It's stupid. <laughs> I mean, it really is. Apart from God doing something, it's the dumbest thing you could ever do. When's the last time you 
sat around and said, man, we look like fools in the eyes of the world. Mm. We do. We trust in a risen Savior, a Messiah who was supposed to set up a kingdom who got killed by the people he was supposed to be king for. That's foolishness, the Bible says. To the world is perishing. But to us is the wisdom of God. So you got marching trumpet men, and the walls fall. Man, I, I long for that more and more in our church, that we would just get done with something and we'd see the walls fall and we'd go, I don't know. It had to have been him. I don't know how else to explain it. He did it work. Do you believe in that God who raises the dead and gives resurrection life to those who can't do anything apart from him? See that? Our discipleship has to be spirit-filled discipleship. Don't miss this. The Spirit of God who raised him from the dead, that's the Spirit. Uh, I want to just, if I can, take a little bit more time and turn over to Luke so we don't miss this. Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, Jesus, actually let's start with Luke 3, verse 21. It says, Now all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized, and was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. That's the first thing the Spirit of God has given us so we might know we're loved by God. I mean, even Jesus heard it out loud. Pretty remarkable before his ministry ever started. It started with the confidence that the Father is pleased with the Son. And I just, again, I want to come back to that again. Do you know for sure that you are loved? And the Father is pleased with you because of your love being hidden in the Son. If not, please go back and get that one right before you do any more ministry. Then he goes on. Uh, I, just, I love this. This, this is just some of my favorite chapters right now, as I've been studying a lot in, in, the, in the terms of the Spirit. Jesus you know, gives his genealogy. You get to chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now, I just want you to just think about that. Jesus is anointed with the Spirit. Jesus is full of the Spirit. Jesus is led by the Spirit for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Let me just ask you this question, because we know the rest of this story. Jesus overcomes temptation. How does Jesus overcome temptation? Scripture. In Spirit. Yeah, okay, quoting Scripture and some said the Spirit of God. Now, what I was taught, and I've been taught this for a long time, if you memorize the Word of God and quote it when you're tempted, you'll overcome temptation. Wrong. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus was full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, and quoting Scripture. Don't miss those two. We're a word and spirit people, not just a word people. And if we think we put confidence merely in the quotation of Scripture, guess what? He used Scripture when he tempted them. When he tempted them. See, Satan's quoting Scripture. Obviously, Scripture can be used to tempt. And pay attention to that. I'm not, please don't hear me. I'm not saying, don't know your word and don't quote it. Obviously, I'm using the Bible. In it. I believe in it. But do not put your hope in the Bible alone. Put your hope in God's Word and the one who inspired it, which is the Holy Spirit. And He's there to bring power to it into your life and to help you overcome temptation. So walk full of the Spirit. In fact, Paul says in Galatians, you want to know how to not give it to the desires of your flesh? Walk in the Spirit. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. Don't miss it. I've heard so many times people go, well, He, came, he overcame temptation because He's the Son of God. Don't miss the fact that the Son of God still was led and full of the Spirit. Don't miss that. Don't, walk, don't write off the Holy Spirit. That's the biggest mistake you can make, I think. Okay, so it's full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit. He overcomes temptation with the Word and the Spirit. Now keep going. It's just it's, oh, so good. Jesus, He's led by the Spirit. And then, then He returns in the power of the Spirit. Verse 14, after He overcomes temptation. And Luke is very methodical in his writing. Don't miss that. He is the most detailed of the gospel writers. So, he, he returns in the power of the Spirit. That's very important. Jesus is still depending on the, on the Spirit of God. And then a report about him goes around the country. He comes to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As his, was his custom, he goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stands up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah is given to him. He unrolls the scroll. And this is important. He finds a place. He's not just reading what's given to him. He looks for a particular spot because he wants to tell them what's going on. So he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me 
to proclaim good news to the poor. Let me just stop. Why was Jesus such a good preacher? Because he had the Holy Spirit. Yep. Hopefully you're catching the pattern here. Yep. Okay? Why did he preach? He tells you why he preached the way he did. Because the Holy Spirit has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. That's it. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to anoint him to preach well. So, preachers here, pray that the Holy Spirit anoints and fills you when you preach. Amen. Don't just trust in your study. Don't just trust in your abilities. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you power. Get unction from Him. When, when you preach with the Spirit anointing and empowering you, you will preach in a different way than just someone who knows the Bible. I, I, I hope that you realize I'm a bit... I, I believe in the power of the Spirit. It is new for you. I don't know. I, I preached one time on this and someone said, Man, you sound like a charismatic. I said, Is there any other kind of Christian? <laughs> okay, and if, if what we mean by charismatic is someone who has the Holy Spirit <laughs> and lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, I hope you're all charismatics in that sense. And maybe you're not charismatics in other sense, but maybe you are at least in that. I hope so. And he goes on, he sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolls up the scroll and he gives it back to the attendant. He sits down, and then he says, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, what you just got was the power of the Holy Spirit coming to you right now, through me. Now, if we fast forward, we hear him casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead. And when you jump forward to the second book that Luke writes, which is Acts, you see a mirror account going on. Don't miss it. Luke is very intentional. He's saying the same spirit that came on Jesus is the same spirit that Jesus told them to wait for so they might have power to do the same things Jesus did with the same power with which Jesus did it. So when they get the Holy Spirit in chapter 2 of Acts, and they, they I don't know if you've ever caught this, we usually skip forward to Peter preaching a message. That's a big mistake. Don't miss the fact that 120 people, men and women, are all proclaiming the mighty deeds of God in languages people can understand by the power of the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus did. Don't miss that. That's why everyone's freaking out. Because Joel's prophecy is coming to be fulfilled. God has poured out His Spirit on all people, men and women, young and old, and they're all proclaiming the mighty deeds of God with power. It's amazing. And what does Peter do? I mean, this is the best preaching job you could ever have. Can you imagine if your whole church was all full of the Spirit, all proclaiming the mighty deeds of God to people in ways that it was changing their lives or making them at least confounded because they couldn't understand what's going on, and they all show up at your building on Sunday and go, what is going on with your people? And you as a pastor go, this could only happen because of Jesus Christ who lived and died for your sins and sent the Spirit into lives of these people that are just normal. I know they're not very impressive. They're a real mess. I know them. I'm a pastor. But I'm just telling you, only God's Spirit could do this. And then you proclaim Jesus as the only hope for anybody to do anything good. And people are going, can we have this too? Yes, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. See, the point of the gospel is not just that your sins might be forgiven. It's that God might be with you and you might walk in power in a new way, giving a foretaste of a future hope of a king who's going to come back and make all things new. It's very good news. It's very good news. And we have the power of that good news in our lives. We should live differently with a power that is not of our own. It's of him who raised him from the dead. It's good news. Last one. So that's, that's we are being saved, if you didn't miss it. I mean, if you missed it, okay? <laughs> We're being said. Hopefully you got that one. I hope you believe that one. Because I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that many of our churches are primarily confessional churches, but not transformational churches. We talk a lot about the power of God for salvation, but we're not experiencing much of it. And that must change. And it only changes by faith. By believing that God is the one who raises the dead. And He gives life to mortal bodies like yours and mine to do things that you couldn't do without your... With your own strength. <clears throat> but it's first Peter. Turn there. And we'll bring it to a close here. First Peter chapter 1. Not only have we been saved from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from the power of sin. But we will be saved from the presence of sin. Chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy. He's caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power 
Uh, there's that same language as Peter, but he's, he's using the language of God's power when he talks about salvation, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, I don't, I don't know how it is for you, but I remember reading that one day, thinking, wait a minute, I thought I was saved. And does this mean I'm not saved? Because it's going to be revealed the last time that there's a future salvation? And, and of course, as I've grown more, I've realized, no, that, that, again, that salvation is a past, present, future reality. And what he's talking about here is that you are secure, that you are kept, that the thing that was purchased for you by Jesus Christ, the salvation of your souls, is kept in heaven. It's unfading. It can't, it can't perish. It can't be robbed of you. It can't be taken away. The very thing that matters most, which is your life, your eternal security in Christ Jesus, is kept in heaven for you. That is such good news. But I found that many people, the reason why they won't live out the life that God's called them to do is because they're afraid of losing something. But what Peter is saying is, the thing that matters most can never be taken away. Your, your eternal inheritance, your, your place as a child of God, your position in the highest realm with Christ Jesus, it can't be taken away. The, you, you can't be any richer. You can't be any more significant. You can't be any more loved. And none of that can be taken away. And the reason why many of us are afraid to walk out into the life God's called us is because we think we're going to lose something. Jim Elliott said, He is no fool who will, who will lose what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You can't lose. You can't lose. Lose your life. For me to, to, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. I can't wait. Kill me. I don't care. It just gets me quicker there. It's good news. Take away my house, my inheritance, my, my, my bank accounts. It doesn't matter. I have the riches of heaven that I'll get to enjoy forever. It doesn't matter. I was talking to a woman yesterday at Exponential. We were talking about you know, how, do we, how do we engage in mission and still protect our kids and, and our home. And she, she, they moved into a, a, a low-income housing area. and They used to live in a much nicer place. And, they feel God's called them there. And she said, should I, should I not have a TV or not have it out when we invite people over because then they'll want to steal it? And should we, you know, because she's talking about all these things. Like, should we just hide everything? Should we not own anything so they don't steal it? I said, who cares if they steal it? Why are you worried? And she was like, yeah, why am I worried? I said, you know, leave it all out. And if they steal it, they steal it. I mean, what are you, what are you losing? A TV? Who cares? Put your hope in that stuff. Think about what you've held on to so tightly in this world. My father-in-law on his deathbed said to my wife, Janie, do not love the things of this world. They have nothing to offer you. Cling to Jesus. Love him more than this world. And I'm just, I mean, every time I think of those words, I think, and that, if, if every Christian understood what they have in Christ Jesus and what they're going to enjoy forever, they would never hold so tightly to the things we hold to the way we do. Our homes, our cars, our possessions, our bank accounts. Tomorrow as I talk about what it means to be a people on mission, I'm going to encourage you to call your people to release everything God's given them back in the hands of the king so that they can serve him with everything they've got instead of trying to hold on to stuff which will only master them and keep them enslaved. So when you really believe that you've got everything and it can't be taken away, you live life without any sense of fear. See, fear is really your, your sense that there's something bigger than God that can come against you or that God's against you. I was, I was telling a woman one time, she was struggling with fear, and I said, by God's grace, he's turned you over to your gods. 